Um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague and friend, Edward Watson, who's the Associate Vice President for Curricular and Pedagogical Innovation with the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and also uh, the, my partner in crime on the ABLE board. So Eddie, it's over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Tracy. Good to see you. Um, good to see everyone. Uh, welcome to this session entitled Practical Strategies for Ensuring the Success of Your ePortfolio Initiative, Stories from the Institute on ePortfolios. I've, I've put together panels in various uh, contexts, you know, probably for two decades now, and often I'll, have, you know, I'll hear someone say, hey, you should check out this, or you should think about this person for a panel, and I don't necessarily have deep, rich knowledge of what those folks may have done, but I'm very fortunate that I do actually have a really uh, deep, rich snapshot of the work that's been done by our four panelists. So as director of AACNU's Institute um, on ePortfolios, these four people on this panel represent four campuses that have participated in the Institute on ePortfolios and spent a year engaging in this work, partnering with the faculty um, within the Institute, which Tracy serves on as well. Um, so I think you're gonna be really, really um, excited by what you're gonna learn over the next hour. These panelists have a deep, rich toolbox for moving things forward on their campus. They've had significant uh, success within their context. So I just couldn't be more excited. We've got four panelists, um, Rachel Swinford's from IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. Nico Nino is at the University of North Carolina, Pembroke. Teresa Johnson is from Ohio State University. I guess I should say the Ohio State University. And Andrew Day is from Southern Oregon University. So each of them is gonna take about 10 minutes to highlight what's been taking place on their campus, the work that they've led, how they've been able to overcome challenges that they've experienced. They'll also give you a brief introduction to their campus as well. Um, but that is our order of presenters, Rachel, Nico, Teresa, and Andrew. And at the conclusion, we'll be happy to engage you in questions. I've got some of my own questions, but I will definitely defer to the questions from the audience. So do post questions within the chat window. I'll be collecting those for our panelists as we conclude. So with that said, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you to share your screen, share your slides, uh, introduce yourself a little bit more, and to let us know what has worked at IUPUI. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I am Rachel Swinford. I am a faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology at IUPUI. And as of uh, just this month, I'm uh, interim co-director of the ePortfolio program for the whole campus um, for this next year. That is uh, in conjunction with Debbie H. Minor. So that's an exciting um, thing. We're reimagining ePortfolios at IUPUI. So we have a nice, um, fun adventure coming up. So uh, to talk specifically about our campus, um, if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so IUPUI is an urban campus in downtown Indianapolis. We have 19,000 undergrad students and 8,000 graduate students. Um, it's the location of IU Medical School. So it's our specific health and science campus um, of Indiana University. Um, it's art and science based primarily at the undergrad level with a very heavy STEM focus at the graduate level. And throughout um, the doctoral, it's very high research activity as well as high community engagement. There's a rich history um, in the past with our engagement with specifically the community around our campus. So when looking at our team that participated in the Institute, we were one of six teams at IUPUI that participated in the Institute last year. So I'm gonna give you a snippet of our small department of kinesiology, um, but there were lots of teams that participated. So in looking at our team, it, um, at that time, it was made up of six different um, team members. I would like to highlight that our department chair was on our team, which was fabulous from um, buy-in and for champion the program and, and really kind of leading us in this effort um, be supporting us basically um because i know that that's sometimes hard <laughs> when you're trying to start a new initiative and you don't have the support at the department level we also had two academic advisors uh, which is kind of a unique um, addition to our team that came from participating in the institute 
Uh, but within our program, we have three different majors, exercise science, fitness management slash personal training, and then our physical education teacher track. When we look at um, specifically our culture, we're very student centered and we focus a lot on community collaboration, such as service learning um, and civic engagement. In our curriculum, we embed nine high impact practices and we do it early and often. For example, in our first year seminar, our students are engaged in a global learning partnership um, where they are working on uh, global nutrition. So to give you a little background about prior to our participation in the program, um, we, are, are you all seeing my screen? Good. Okay, cool. Um, we first started electronic portfolios way back in 2011 with something called an electronic personal development plan. And this was specifically focused on the students' academic and career development through up till gra graduation. Um, in 2016, we got an internal grant to launch, launch a program level e-portfolio for all of our students in kinesiology. The problem with that is that it didn't go great. Um, it was kind of a flop and we were very focused on career readiness and cre students creating a product. So we did a lot of things wrong and we, so much so that some, um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to that article that you're seeing there. So we published this paper basically about what we did wrong and what we suggest when you're starting an e-portfolio. So we relaunched in 2018. We took a one-year hiatus. Um, two of our members attended ABLE. We worked with um, Susan Kahn on our campus to really look at what we did wrong and how we can redo that moving forward. And our current implementation serves as a reflective e-portfolio. And what's nice about it is it's process focused rather than just simply that product. And then we introduce it in the first year seminar and they go throughout um, the program all the way up to their capstone or internship course. And our primary outcome for students is to teach the importance of self-reflection and then instill those skills necessary to become a reflective practitioner, which is important in any field related to health and wellness. Uh, so we just completed our uh, four, year four of our launch and year four is when we participated in the Institute. So why did we participate in the Institute? We were looking at really this ongoing challenge of student buy-in, engagement, and ownership of their e-portfolio. Uh, so we worked on two projects during the Institute, one that we implemented actually during the Institute, and then the other one we implemented shortly after. So we planned for it and implemented it shortly after. Uh, the first project was introducing e-portfolio via journey mapping. And we'll be doing a session on this Friday <laughs> to talk about um, the journey map and, and we'll give you kind of an abbreviated um, assignment of what that looked like. But basically we worked with our wonderful coach and mentor, Helen Chen, uh, to help us create and implement and assess our program. So what we did prior to even talking about e-portfolios is we introduced a journey map. And essentially it was an in-class pen and paper assignment where students thought about their life journey so far and they reflected on key significant moments in their life. And then as you can see there on the right, this is one sample. Um, they then create a map that visually represents their life journey so far and what it was that they believe got them to uh, being a freshman at IUPUI. They all looked very different, um, but we were using reflection throughout that project. And we've learned a, a couple of things from it. We're now expanding it to a, a two day rather than a one day in class assignment because it, it felt a little bit rushed. Um, our second project that we did shortly after the Institute, but we planned for during, is that in order to further engage students, um, we wanted to add academic advising. So we found we had a lot of touch points early in the courses as freshmen, not a lot of sophomores, maybe one as a junior, and then um, again as a senior. So we really wanted to see how else can we have students look at their e-portfolio and realize um, there's a, 
there's more than just the audience of faculty that are looking at it. So sophomores were already required to attend a sophomore appointment where they looked at um, kind of their academic plan, make sure they're on track, see if anything changed. But we added about a five minute component where they talked about and reviewed the student's e-portfolio. And then we did a survey after that appointment that had a quantitative question and then also asked students, how do you plan to engage in e-portfolios, in your e-portfolio this next year? Um, so with that, um, our current challenges with these two projects, I already stated that journey mapping felt rushed in one 75 minute class period. So we're actually going to expand it to two or three class periods um, this next fall. And then staff turnover and academic advising. Um, we've, we started with one academic advisor, they left, we had another academic advisor, they left last month. So I guess really just making sure that we have it within the academic component as a set standard rather than working just one-on-one -on -one with those specific academic advisors. Uh, one more thing that I will add into the chat is our journey mapping project was part of an ebook um, that was edited by Lisa Donaldson. Um, so if you wanted to read more about that, that is linked there. Um, and we'll be doing again Friday, the journey mapping session. And um, right after this session, we'll be talking about our um, advising. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And that in a nutshell is our background and our, our participation in the Institute. Thanks, Rachel. We'll go to Miko next. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Miko Nino, Director of Online Learning at UNCP. And I'm very thankful for the Institute because it really helped us change the perspectives that we had about the program. And it was very nice to have the support. And they didn't make me say that, but I'm being honest. It really gives you guidance to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And it's always nice to have somebody to bounce off some ideas. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our journey. So UNCP, it's a minority serving institution. We are located in Pembroke, North Carolina. Historically, we have been connected to the Lombie Nation, the Lombie tribe. And in this institution in particular, we have undergrad and grad degrees. But one thing that they didn't have was an e-portfolio program. And I had been doing e-portfolios before. So when I came here, I saw an opportunity. And, and I mentioned that because some of you might be in that boat in which e-portfolios are not even part of the conversation. And that adds another layer of challenge for sure. But that doesn't mean that you cannot accomplish what you want. So our journey is connected to a school that had never done e-portfolios. So the office leading this program, what's basically the Office of Online Learning, it's a very small office. And it's basically me, the director, we have two instructional designers, a project manager. That's a very key role for us because when you have so many projects, somebody has to know about the progress and the limitations that you might have. We have an admin associate and we also had at the time an online learning assistant, which was a student. And we had to wear multiple hats. We had to help with everything. You saw all of us doing training, all of us on a table, promoting the program, doing graphic design. We were doing a little bit of everything. And we have a special shout out for our mentor in the Institute, Dr. Tracy Penny Light, which really helped us uh, through the process with lots of ideas. And in a way, it was a validation when you do something and you have a validation and somebody tells you, well, this is good, you may want to try that, that really helps. So for our program, I wanted to create something catchy because again, keep in mind that this is a school that had never talked about e-portfolios before. So we partner with our marketing department and they help us come up with the EPICS name for the program, which stands for the e-portfolio initiative for career success. So we wanted to do something student-centered because we believe that sometimes when one department is responsible after the interactions with the students end, 
the students might be left hanging. And we wanted to give the students the ownership of the process and we want them to have the resources to go through the program on their own. So it was a student center. We always wanted to do student center. And I particularly have been always interested in the career e-portfolios. I think everything started for me as an user. When I found myself looking for jobs back in the days and not having an e-portfolio and seeing the need, I started as a personal user for career purposes. And from then I started into the practice and the research. And I wanted to provide to the students something that could help them document the learning, engage in reflection, but also use once they graduated, once they were leaving the school and they wanted to get their dream jobs. So for me, the career component was very important. Focus again in career e-portfolios, but we didn't want just to focus on career. We wanted to recognize learning portfolios, the importance of learning e-portfolios. And so basically we wanted something that connect that learning with career readiness. And something that I mentioned yesterday in, in a session that I did is when you are working on your e-portfolio program, you need to have a why. Besides just having an e-portfolio program, what's the one thing you want your students to achieve through this program? Is it that you want to promote 21st century skills? Is it that you want them to document learning? Or do you want them to have better reflections? Or what, what exactly do you want? And for me, it was that, the connecting the learning and the career readiness. And you will be surprised, and that's something that I learned in the Institute. When you have that why very clear, that will always give you guidance through the process. And I wanted to build a system of stakeholders. Yes, it's a student center, but I wanted, to, I wanted faculty to be involved, the community, industry experts, other colleagues, alumni. So that net of support was really important for, for us. So we wanted to have something that will help us be guided through the process. So we created what I call the backbone because that's exactly what's still guiding our program. And it's called a 6A e-portfolio model. I'm gonna share the link at the end of my presentation. This has been published in the International Journal of e-portfolio, but basically this model helps you go through the process. It, it's an implementation model and students go through the process from valuing and seeing why you need to have an e-portfolio all the way to being assessed in class, doing the reflections, doing some tweaks for that learning e-portfolio to become a career e-portfolio and then be ready to apply and showcase that e-portfolio. And you will see at the bottom, the 6A, it's alliance. It's because we believe in community. We believe in partnerships in every single step. There is a place not only for the Office of Online Learning or whoever is implementing these or the students, but it's also a place for the community, for industry, for alumni, for other partners, other departments as well. So let me tell you what we have done so far for implementation. Acceptance was very key for us, and that's a very important lesson from the Institute. You cannot start talking about assessments and 21st century skills and how to build an e-portfolio. I believe if people are not fully into that. So I really encourage people to spend some time selling the value of e-portfolios. Once you start telling people why you should have an e-portfolio, all the uses of an e-portfolio, why it's important to showcase that e-portfolio, when people start having that effective domain work and they see the value, then it's going to be easier to sell the rest. So we spent a lot of time building that brand. We treated the whole thing as a product. So what we did was create the name, Epix, and we made sure we were part of the conversation on a daily basis. I was in every single event having a table. We got swag. We were on social media. We created a hashtag. Every single opportunity that I had to go to orientation or any events, even if it was just five minutes to talk to the students, hey, go to our website, uncp.edu slash epics, posting on social media. There is a free digital display here on campus, and I make sure we had an, an ad there that was free. I went to the Starbucks, which is our busiest spot on campus, and there's a corner where you wait for your coffee, and I there's a board, and I went there and I pinned 
a flyer with information about the program. And sometimes I was just handing flyers with my team that said epics, find out more at this website. So you, I, we make sure we build that awareness, that brand. And it was a little pushy, you might say, but we managed to be part of the conversation because of that name, that acronym, and being present everywhere. Once everybody was curious, faculty, staff, students about epics, we started giving some presentations. And those presentations, again, was what's an e-portfolio? We made sure we show specific examples of what an e-portfolio looked like and what things you had to include there. And we had training for students, but we also had training for faculty. And we also start, started having conversations with industry experts, with people in the area connected with career services who were recruiting students. So they knew that our students could potentially have an e-portfolio, and we were asking what trends in industry they were seeing, and that information was really important for us to sell the value of an e-portfolio. And one thing that really helped us, uh, not only here, but in another institution, it really helped me. If you want to increase your number of users, if you want your e-portfolio program to be part of the conversation, have a showcase. And sometimes we believe that a showcase has to be always when people are advanced, and that's true. You want to have really strong e-portfolios. But I believe that for beginners and for intermediate, you can have also showcases. It's very important just to make that distinction. But the sooner students get a chance to be exposed, to build their own, to be judged. I, When we created a showcase, it was a competition. We gave cash awards. We invited uh, experts from the field to be judges. Some of them are actually here on this, uh, on this call. Our mentor and people from uh, ABLE were part of that as well. Thank you for, for joining us. But the students, when they saw that they had that interaction, that networking opportunity, that was amazing for them. And now that we're talking about building equality and justice and all of that, many students don't have an opportunity to network. Many students don't have personal connections. Not everybody has the same level of opportunities to interact with people in industry. And these showcases, bringing these mentors, bringing these judges, gives everyone an opportunity to start building that professional network. And that's one thing that the students uh, really engage in. I'm going give to be giving a presentation about that showcase tomorrow if you want to know more about that. But we also talk about the assessment with faculty. After the accept acceptance was there, the value we made sure faculty found an opportunity to redesign their assessments, to promote 21st century skills, creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, the communication. Those things are really important. Also reflection, what's a good reflection? How can you engage in reflection? How can you face that resistance? And one thing we tell the students is that one of the best exercises to practice for a job interview is the reflection. When you engage into that metacognition, into that reflection process, it will be very hard for people to get you off guard with questions during the interview, for instance. So there's value in doing it, not only for the learning purposes, but also for career readiness. We customize training according to the departments. We were fully open for consultations, and we also have working groups for faculty. We are starting a community of practice, an e-portfolio community of practice, soon in the fall. So for the students, we have the showcase, we offer coaching sessions, consultations, and we had a website where they could find uh, all the information. And again, tomorrow I'm gonna be talking about the showcase because there's a, a journey, it's just not the showcase. We prepare the students for that big day. And that's something that I'm gonna be uh, talking about tomorrow. But in the interest of time, I think this covers my time slot. This is my contact information, and I'll be happy to connect with you if you have any questions and congratulations on being part of the Institute. It's a life-changing experience and you're going to be learning a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Miko. I'm gonna pivot just a little bit on our plan. Um, I do encourage if you have questions for Miko or Rachel thus far, just looking at the clock and, and managing time, you might just go ahead and pose those in the chat window and Miko and Rachel, if you don't mind keeping your eyes on the chat window and responding to questions. And we'll do the same thing when Teresa's session concludes as well. Hopefully we've got some time for open Q&A at the end, but if not, you can still interact with the presenters via the chat window. With that said, Teresa, tell us about your work at Ohio State. 
All right, let's see if I can make this work on my one tiny monitor. I am I am not in Columbus. I am north of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So let's see if we can make this work. All right. So um, as Eddie told you, I am uh, Teresa Johnson. I am the high impact curriculum expert at the Office of Academic Enrichment at Ohio State University. Um, Oh, academic enrichment is, uh, you'll, you'll learn later, but it, it houses a bunch of the high impact practices on campus as well as our honors and scholars program. So a little bit of um, background on Ohio State. Uh, we have about 65,000 students, both undergrad and graduate across five different campuses in Ohio. Uh, our Columbus campus is the largest campus. We uh, welcome about 7,000 incoming undergraduate uh, freshmen each year. And uh, we are a very, um, power is very distributed at Ohio State. So the colleges uh, wield a lot of power as well as the faculty on campus. We also have currently a decades old general education program um, that is also very um, highly variable by college. Uh, the, we have been doing an, a portfolio program on campus um, that has been located within the Honors and Scholars Program, which are two different um, high-achieving uh, high groups of students on campus. Um, for the last six or seven years, those students have been doing an e-portfolio. It's been on a homegrown platform, and there's not really been a lot of uh, support for students through that, through that program. It's just we haven't had the staff to support that. However, all of that is changing because um, in less than five weeks now, we are launching a brand new gen ed program. And uh, with that new gen ed program is a built in e-portfolio requirement and opportunity for students. So every student, every incoming student on campus will begin um, curating and building their e-portfolio now as a requirement for graduation. So lots of things are changing, which is why we, um, applied to be part of the uh, ePortfolio Institute, and we are working with Eddie as our, our mentor, which has been incredibly helpful. So in order to understand a little bit of, of what this looks like, I wanted to show you our Gen Ed program structure. Um, the important thing that I want you to notice are the two red bars here on the left and the right. We call these our bookend courses, and they are the launch seminar and the reflection seminar. They are both one hour, one credit hour courses. And this is where um, ePortfolio is introduced and then uh, wrapped up and, and sort of tied up in a nice, a nice bow at the end. Um, the rest of this is all, uh, all of the courses that they take in between. The important thing about this is that there is a large gap. Uh, so the gap in between the little tiny one credit course at the beginning and the little tiny one credit course at the end, that's the part that we are really focusing on this year in the Institute um, and figuring out how do we not just abandon students with this idea, tell them here, go build an e-portfolio and then leave them alone for three or four years and then come back at the end and say, great, let's put all of the stuff that you've been curating together. Um, and isn't, it, isn't the portfolio a wonderful thing? So we decided that might not actually work very well for students that, that really don't know how to reflect and don't really understand the concept of e-portfolio. So that's what we've been challenged with trying to fill is that gap. So I'm gonna go through the different ways that we are working on filling that gap um, with my next few slides here. Um, so the first one is that we knew that we needed a really robust um, platform. And I am happy to announce that Ohio State has officially adopted PebblePad um, that we are working with. And it's, um, we are really excited about what PebblePad can do for us and for our students. It offers all sorts of really wonderful ways to create um, workbooks and resources for students. And you can do that in specific groups. So we have a particular workbook that is created for the GE. So all of our GE students have a particular workbook. We will have a different workbook for our honors students. So they can, they'll be using both the GE workbook and the honors workbook, and they'll know what resources they need to work on filling out and building into part of their ePortfolio as they move through. 
Um, it also provides really great ways to help students link their assets or the things that they build, the reflections or their assignments that they put into their ePortfolio to learning outcomes. So there's a really nice way for students to see that connection between I've done this and this has helped me learn that. Um, that's, so those are some of the reasons that we're really excited about uh, using Pebble Pods coming this fall. Um, we, the second thing that we are doing to fill this uh, three or four year gap in between those two courses is to hire an e-portfolio specialist. Um, and that is where we're this close. Um, the person is going to be starting here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that person will be providing support for pedagogical innovation for ePortfolio with, with our faculty that are going to be using it in their courses. Um, they will be providing some basic um, technology support to students, uh, and they will be helping faculty develop courses that include um, pedagogy, um, portfolio or folio thinking pedagogy. They'll also be helping us with ePortfolio assessment and they will be managing a team of uh, student peer mentors that we're hoping we'll provide. Here's the catch with this. If you remember, we have 65,000 students, 7,000 students coming in each year, and we are hiring one person. That one person is not under the whole university. They are actually working in my group in OAE, Office of Academic Enrichment. So they will be, for the time being, limited to working with students who are in honors and scholars, who go through our second year transformational experience program or STEP um, that do undergraduate research, students that are part of service learning courses, and students that interact with our undergraduate fellowship office. Now, having said that, our honors and scholars core um, students alone make up 40% of Ohio State's student population. So by the time you add STEP, which also works with thousands of students and all students that take these other types of courses or, or work with for fellowships, we're actually talking about a huge percentage of the population of the of campus, of our student population, but it's not everybody. So there is that. Um, one of the things that we are still working on, and I hope I can't see the, the rest of my slides, so hopefully you can see this. We are working on um, recruiting champions. So recruiting the faculty and staff that are really going to help um, everyone else understand why this is such an amazing opportunity. So we are starting slowly. We're working with our GE bookend instructors. They have one director who is part of our team um, in the Institute this year. And so they will be um, hearing a lot about and getting a lot of support for how to build the e-portfolio process into those bookends, which are right now the anchor courses for that process. Our scholars managers, the, 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 our scholars groups um, are in cohorts. They're in learning communities and they each have a manager. So those people are getting a lot of training and support to learn how to bring e-portfolio thinking to their students. Uh, our step mentors for that second year transformational program, they will be, that, that won't be until next year that they'll be moving in, but they'll be getting a lot of support as well. And as we move further out, we have a certain type of courses in our GE program called Themes Courses. Um, they'll be getting support, our honors course instructors, and then recruited, self-recruited instructors, people that just come and say, I really want to do this. So that's sort of our, our pathway to recruiting as many faculty as, as we can. Um, but Eddie keeps telling me it's okay to do this slowly. So we're, we're working on slow rather than mass trying to bring everybody on board at once. We're also trying to think about how do we build support for students in a broad way. So one of the things that we're thinking about, we really like the concept of students um, bringing together their thinking about what have I learned in all the areas of their lives and not just in the classroom, that that's not the only place that learning happens. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to work with a lot of different groups on campus that work with students in different ways. So things like our peer mentors, um, hiring and, and training peer mentors. That, again, will be through the Honors and Scholars Program. Um, student life programs. There are all sorts of amazing student life programs that are happening on campus. We want them to be aware of ePortfolio and to use the same language and to talk to students. When you participate in this program, then it provides you with, a, with some really rich information that you might want to put in, in, in your ePortfolio and reflect on that. Student employment programs. We have a wonderful program that sort of helps students learn employment skills 
um, during their time doing work study on campus. So we want to talk to them about ePortfolio and how can the students that are doing work on campus use that in their ePortfolio. Student organizations, if a student is involved in a student organization, they should be thinking about that in their ePortfolio. We know those places have uh, faculty mentors, so we could go to those people. Career services, our student athlete support, they have a lot of uh, tutoring there. We think that might be helpful. And also our mental health care professionals. We're really interested in looking at can ePortfolio reflection practice help with mental health? And so thinking about maybe how our mental health professionals could help think, help students think through what they might want to put in there um, as, they, as they work on their, um, their mental health. So those are all things that are yet to be built out. We, we, have, we have plans to interact with those people, but that is not yet happening. And again, those are gonna be in the in-between spaces in that gap. Uh, and we're just starting students this fall. This is our first launch into this. So some other longer term challenges that we have that we're still thinking through how to do all of this. Uh, we have a completely new upper admin level administration. All of that administration came in after the GE um, portfolio process was all approved. So they don't own any of this. So, they, so far they seem to be embracing it and seem to be pretty, um, supportive of it, but that's something that we're still negotiating is making sure that they seem to approve of what it is that we're doing. Um, we're all suffering, and this is not just Ohio State, but everybody's suffering from change fatigue. We've got change fatigue from the new GE and from a, a change in our administration, but also from going through two years of not knowing where our next class was going to be held, whether it was going to be online or in person or a combination. So everybody's tired and the idea of bringing in a whole new exciting initiative right now with new technology and all of this is a little daunting. Um, I was excited, Miko, to see what you were saying about your marketing and communications. I'm going to be looking back through your slides and seeing what I can glean from there because we're, we are still trying to figure out who's going to do that for us because, because the ePortfolio is an enterprise wide thing with every student. It doesn't, the marketing and communications doesn't seem to belong in any particular place with how Ohio State is built, so that's going to be hard. Um, Long-term financial sustainability, right now a lot of this, um, the cost of all of this with support and the platform and all of that is riding on the, um, the incoming tuition for the GE bookends, and we'd like for that to be spread out a bit more because it feels, that feels unsustainable to me long-term. That's my personal opinion. Um, we also want to provide gap support to non-OAE students, so students that aren't in honors and scholars or service learning or all of those other things that I listed. Uh, we're not sure how to do that financially yet because our ePortfolio specialist is specifically um, hired to provide that subset of students support for them. Um, and we're also thinking long term about there's sort of a backdoor um, administrative part of Pebble that is really useful, but it is it takes a lot of um, tech support to be able to have everybody playing around in that the back end of, of Pebble. And so we're we are thinking about how to provide um, enough tech support to really allow anyone that wants to build out workbooks and those sorts of things. So that's, that's something else that we're thinking about long term. And I think I'll stop there. I have another slide or so if, if people have questions. Well, hey, Teresa, there are a couple of questions in the chat room. So I think that'll keep you busy for the next few minutes. But if you have questions again, okay. or Teresa or Miko or Rachel, definitely post them in the chat window. And with that, we'll turn it over to Andrew Gay from Southern Oregon University. Andrew. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, I, I feel kind of like the 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 baby in the group because uh, I'm I'm uh, about I'm kind of in a similar place as, as Teresa, but I, about a year behind. We are in the middle of a GE transformation that will launch in the fall of 2023, and are trying to do some similar work, um, but not with with maybe a few fewer resources than than the Ohio State. Um, Southern Oregon University is a small uh, public regional liberal arts university. Um, this is our enrollment that's um, primarily undergraduate. We do have graduate programs, but we're overwhelmingly an undergraduate university. And um, we are in Ashland, Oregon, uh, which if, you, if you've never been here, it's, it's roughly midway between um, San Francisco and Portland with not much in between. Uh, we, we are a pretty kind of rurally located and isolated. 
and I and I'm, I didn't put it on the slide, but I might also note that we are in a multi-million dollar uh, budget deficit right now. So there's major cuts going on, uh, on across the university. Um, so not an environment where we have a lot of opportunities to add new resources to support um, new initiatives. Uh, so why are we in the Institute? Uh, we are entering the fourth year of a general education remodel uh, that we hope will launch in fall 2023. We seem to be on track for that. And I've been um, kind of overseeing that process for the last few years. And um, the task force that I led recommended that all students um, complete an e-portfolio as a part of their GE experience. Um, we've never done anything like that at SOU before. There are some isolated programs on campus that have worked with e-portfolios, um, but there's never been any kind of um, uh, effort to do something university-wide with uh, a program like this. So um, what our team has been trying to do as part of the Institute this year is to design an e-portfolio pilot program. I think originally when we um, first started talking to Tracy, who's, who's our mentor, um, I think we were a little more ambitious thinking like, oh yeah, we want to we want to have the, the full e-portfolio ready to go. Uh, and, and she kind of talked us down and said, well, let's take baby steps. So um, we're doing a pilot in this first year. So I um, just want to address a couple of the uh, goals of our GE transformation because that plays into our approach to the e-portfolio. Um, one is that our GE was quite old, about 15 years old, and um, really did not align with our university's new strategic plan. Uh, we also had a state mandate, a, a, a bill that was passed requiring cultural competency to be a part of our um, education, and that wasn't really being implemented well. Um, overall, uh, SOU had the highest number of gen ed credit requirements of any university, a public university in Oregon, and that was a real detriment to our students, especially that because we serve a lot of uh, transfer students who would come in and have thought they would, you know, coming in, having thought they completed their gen ed and then would get here and have to do a lot more and then they uh, graduate with more cre credits than they needed to get a degree. Um, we, one of the things we really found in talking with our students was that most of them could not tell you why they were taking gen ed um, or what they were learning in gen ed. It wasn't necessarily that the classes were bad. Um, the, the classes are great and, and that you're certainly learning, but they weren't seeing, you know, why these courses were required. They weren't, they weren't seeing how they all connected and in any kind of sense that there was a overall purpose to a general education. Uh, we also wanted to create something that might um, attract students to SOU. Uh, I don't think most students pick their university because of the general education, but we are in, in competition with a lot of community colleges. And um, when students can get their general education completed in a cheaper uh, environment uh, at the community college level, we, we definitely wanted to be able to offer something that maybe is a little different. And, and if a student was looking at between it coming directly to SOU or going to community college first, uh, maybe offering something that said, oh, well, this, this sounds kind of exciting. Maybe I do want to do my gen ed at SOU. Uh, and then, of course, uh, because we have a lot of uh, transfer students, we wanted to make sure that all the changes we made would work for our transfer students. So I'm not going to give a, a detailed picture of, of, of our changes, but this kind of gives a snapshot of how we changed our, um, our learning outcomes. We went from um, 10 primarily disciplinary centric stand, uh, strands that we call them to uh, six capacities. And, and what we really wanted to focus on is what do we want students to demonstrate? Uh, we want students to be able to understand what they're walking away from, uh, walking, walking away with as they exit um, the general education. And so the, um, the six capacities are here on the right. And, and I'm gonna talk mostly about now the purposeful learning capacity, which is kind of the super capacity that brings all the others together. I clicked away accidentally. Oh, there we go. So um, the purposeful learning capacity we see as a lens through which students see um, all of their other learning at SOU. We really want them to start making uh, metacognitive connections between uh, their education, meaning both, both the general education, um, their major work, 
um, other classes they might be taking, as well as the other experiences going on in their life. Um, so that might be co-curricular experiences, might be their personal life, the, the, the work they're doing in their job, a nonprofit they're involved in, their church, whatever it might be. We really want to help them start making connections between all of these things as one unified experience. And uh, the way we are hoping to do that is through a uh, series of four goals that we want students want to help students develop. So we want students to develop goals for their self-awareness, health, and well-being, for learning and growth, for career and finances, and for relationships and, and uh, community. And so we're hoping that this will be the basis for an e-portfolio that students will come in and start um, from day one in, in, at SOU um, developing their goals in these areas. And then as they go through our general education program, make connections between the classes they're taking and um, the goals that they have set for themselves. Keep getting stuck here for some reason. There we go. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, a pilot program with, um, uh, a program at SOU called Bridge. And so Bridge is a first year experience um, that, that works specifically with students that are um, kind of high need, high risk students, um, students who are underrepresented. Uh, so this is a program that students do have to apply for and um, special consideration is given to um, those again who are underrepresented on campus, including uh, low-income students, um, first-generation students, um, students from underrepresented uh, race and ethnic groups, uh, et cetera. And uh, so this is a program where there's a lot of extra support for students. They come in and get a week-long um, preterm uh, program. So they, they, they come in a week early to campus, uh, take a bunch of workshops and classes, and then they also take additional um, uh, an additional class that supports them uh, during their uh, first term. So this is the uh, pre-fall experience that they have, and this is where we will do onboarding uh, in the Purposeful Learning ePortfolio. So we'll be doing two sessions with students, one just kind of teaching them the technology, and in our case, we're working just, um, we're going to work primarily with Google Sites, but also let students work with um, you know, Wix or uh, Weebly or anything else that they want to use, but we're going to provide a, a Google Sites template. And um, so we'll do a session on the technology, kind of helping them understand how to uh, build an e-portfolio, and then a session on, you know, the purpose of an e-portfolio and, and why that work is meaningful and, and kind of trying to inspire them about why this isn't just another piece of busy work, but something that can be really meaningful for their lives. And then they have this additional class that goes, uh, that they take in their first term uh, and, and that um, e we hope to offer continued e-portfolio support uh, for them as they go through that class as well. So this is a one credit class where, student, where those bridge students continue to kind of reconnect with each other and with the um, bridge support faculty. Um, again, just sort of helping them along the way in their first term at SOU and um, getting that little extra care and attention. And so that's, uh, again, where the ePortfolio is gonna live for this um, pilot project. And so here's just a little example of our template um, uh, we've uh, developed. So in the template, students are prompted um, on the, the area goals, the, learn, the purposeful learning area goals and um, making connection with some of their, the structure of that bridge class. So um, our, our Hart, uh, who is our um, kind of technology expert in our Center for um, Teaching and Learning has built this template for us. And she did a really great job of kind of looking at the bridge structure and identifying connections between each, uh, each kind of week's topic and how those connect to our four goals. So this is just one example of how it ties in. What we haven't done in this, in this pilot is connected to the gen ed goals uh, outside of purposeful learning because they haven't launched yet. So we didn't wanna put in all the other goals because it won't make sense to students because they're still on that old, those old strands. Um, so that's gonna be kind of interesting is right now we're only working on the purposeful learning and seeing how that works this year in the pilot. And then next year, 
with uh, phasing in the, um, the learning goals for the new general, general education, it'll be interesting to see how we kind of fold that in to this template um, going from there. So we have a lot of um, the similar challenges, lots of um, uh, initiative fatigue. It was really difficult to even get this um, gen ed uh, redesign approved. Uh, it took a really heavy lift um, to persuade faculty to embrace it. And there are still faculty on campus who would immediately embrace uh, <laughs> going back and not doing it after all. Um, it's been a lot of work, um, but, but faculty are, um, are really tired and the, the pandemic has been really hard and the economic situation at the campus is really hard. So right now we're, we're figuring out how to do something that's good, but um, knowing that we won't be able to pull out all the stops to support it. So um, that's where we're at right now. So thank you. Well, I do welcome questions in the chat window, but Andrew, you kind of hinted at something that I think I'd like to pose to all four of our panelists, which is really this notion of initiative of fatigue on campus. And I think it's initiative fatigue that's been complicated by a range of other things that have been swirling around all of us in higher education. So I guess I would pose that question to all four panelists. And I'll start with you though, Andrew. How has your team combated initiative fatigue on campus? <laughs> um, most well, my my effort has mostly been a lot of patience. Um, as the leader of the Gen Ed Task Force for the past three years, I've gotten so many angry, frustrated emails, and my effort has just been to be just really listen, and be compassionate and empathetic, and do everything I can possibly uh, to ease people in into these ideas. So. With the ePortfolio pilot specifically, um, that's one reason why we decided to work just with the bridge program. Originally, we were hoping to do something that was much broader and, and looking at a, a courses across the gen ed, but um, we knew that that was going to really turn people off and especially all the work they've just done to approve their courses in this new uh, gen ed. Um, asking them then to embrace ePortfolios was going to be a really heavy lift. But the faculty who work with Bridge, it's, it's this one little dedicated area, and, and they were already doing a lot of very similar work already. And so it was a really nice match because um, they're kind of already doing this, just they weren't doing necessarily an e-portfolio, uh, but allowing us to bring in and say, hey, we're going to give you this template and we're going to support you through this was a really great way to ease us into it. Um, I'm not sure how we'll go the next step, but at least was one way to um, take it off the shoulders of the rest of the faculty. Hey, you know, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, uh, Tracy and I have been uh, chatting in the background a little bit, and there, there needs to be a room turnover for the one o'clock sessions. I know that uh, Nico has a session in four minutes as well. So I think we need to conclude at this point, but join me in thanking our panelists for sharing just the fantastic work they've been doing um, over the past year and will be on into the past. Um, and we look forward to seeing you later on in the conference. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for these great presentations. Very inspiring.